Okay, welcome everybody, Shavua Tov. Um, my name is Yordana Asban, for those of you who don't know. Um, and uh, this is a third in our series of TRM Global Journeys, where we've had a privilege of hearing from uh, interesting diplomats or people working on interesting things around the world. I'm sorry, I'm in the dark. I'm not in a good <laughs> lit room tonight. Um, tonight's speaker uh, really came to us uh, in a great way because Ari Rosenblum participated in some of the earlier global journeys and said, I have a great person to come speak to us. Um, and I love when we do one program and it inspires another person, that's always the best. So we are thrilled to have today Israeli ambassador Zahavid Ben Hillel, um, who is the Israeli ambassador to Uzbekistan and Tagestan. Um, and I know that you, Ari, you and her go uh, way back um, so I will let you formally introduce her. Um, we will run this program the way we've done previous ones. Well, they will be in conversation. She has some interesting pictures to show us. Um, and then we'll leave it open for some uh, direct questions and conversation um, afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to um, Ari and Ambassador Ben Hillel. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, good evening, everybody. I um, had the privilege of getting to know Zavit, uh, well, I guess close to 20 years ago uh, in, uh, in Toronto, uh, where she was on the staff of the consulate. And uh, at the time, it was, it was challenging from a, a diplomatic and, a, I guess, an advocacy point of view. And we in the advocacy field worked closely with the consulate uh, to deal with everything that came our way. Uh, in the press, uh, on campus, you name it. And uh, I, I found Zavit to be an incredible resource for us, for the organization I worked for, and for the community. And that was an earlier posting of hers. And she has, uh, you know, gone on to uh, many postings, both in Israel and abroad. And uh, I wanted to welcome her and thank her very, very much uh, for joining us. And just before we get started, I wanted to point out and, and actually give a, a thank you not only to Zavit, but also to the entire diplomatic corps of, uh, of Israel, uh, of the foreign ministry in Israel, because it's a tough, tough job. And, you know, we here in the US and Canada, whatever, we have uh, organizations like uh, Friends of the Israel Defense Forces, which show appreciation for the IDF, and we all do. Uh, first of all, everybody in the diplomatic corps pretty much is, is uh, you know, has served in the IDF, but they also continue to serve the country in a diplomatic role, and I don't think they get enough uh, recognition. So here, I just wanted to say thank you to Zahavit for all that you do, and thank you to all of your colleagues, some of whom I know, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm in awe of what you guys do. So I just wanted to get started. Uh, so Zahavit, if you could tell us, uh, when you uh, were considering uh, what to do when you got out of the army, uh, what was interesting about the Foreign Service, and and was it competitive to get in? It's a, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Ari, on, on, on behalf of the entire Israeli <laughs> diplomatic corps, I thank you. It's, it's nice to be recognized sometimes. Um, uh, so, uh, to, to your question, well, you know, it's um, a... When I finished my, uh, my army service, I was a sergeant in the... Um, in the human resources corp wasn't anything fancy, uh, but uh, what I did there is um, I dealt mainly with uh, it was like an IDF unit, uh, IDF spokesperson's unit, but like a branch in the in in the human resources, so uh, or manpower as we called it. So I dealt with journalists and I dealt with delegation from Jewish communities. And I dealt with, you know, people asking questions and we needed to, anyways, I, I was doing something that was, you know, on the a verge of diplomacy, but without even knowing that, that that's what I was doing. And I think that the fact that I got there probably led me in some way to, to where I am now. And I, I truly believe that everything you do, every, you know, posting and station that you have in your life is kind of lead you, leading you to the, to the next one. So if you'd ask me, you know, at the age of 20, um, that, you know, years later, I will be sitting here talking to you, probably, I probably would say no way. Um, and, uh, uh, but the first thing I did on my, I started studying at Hebrew University, international relations, 
which of course, you know, leads to diplomacy. But at the time, you know, I just, um, you know, went along and I said, okay, what am I gonna study? Like, I didn't know. So, you know, I decided to go for international relations. My first summer, um, I, um, I went to uh, be a counselor in a, in, a, in a JCC camp, not far from where you guys are. It's the JCC of Greater Philadelphia. I was in, a, in the middle of, you know, Pennsylvania in a place called Ziegler'sville that, you know, all these villes in the, you know, out in the country. And it was the first time I think that I, um, I realized you know, that there's a world, a Jewish world outside of Israel, pretty much, you know, um, and that was a very eye-opening experience. Um, and then I continued my studying and my second summer at university, I was a counselor in Israel for a six week program. And that was even, you know, giving me another layer of understanding of, you know, what is happening around us. And on my third year of, and last year of university, everybody at, uh, at the international relations department applied for the foreign ministry. So I decided to, you know, to go with the flow and applied. And then, you know, you pass on the first test and then the second level and the second level. And you asked whether it was competitive. Um, I guess, you know, you have, you know, thousands of, of, uh, of people applying and, and, and at the end, very few fortunate ones are able to get in. And, and there it was, you know, I was literally finishing my university studies when you get a phone call and you're saying congratulations in a month time you're going to be joining the uh the foreign service so i was kind of happy because it felt like you know everything led me there without having to you know make any you know big decisions and and there i was at 24 um already uh, uh um, on my first steps of uh, becoming a diplomat so could you tell us uh, a couple things about some of your earliest postings and, and some of the lessons that you learned in diplomacy at that stage? Uh, it's kind of interesting because during usually in, in the Israeli Foreign Service, at least, you know, when I was there, things have changed through, through the years for, for several reasons that maybe we'll have time to get into. But when I was, um, when I joined in, uh, the process was that you, you did a six months very, very intensive course. Sometimes when I, when I, when I speak to groups, especially to, to, um, to younger people, students, teenagers, I ask them, what do you think Israeli diplomats learn in the cadet course, in the diplomatic course? And they come up with all kinds of ideas. And sometimes they, you know, them, they hit it uh, uh, right at that spot. And, and, and they understand that what we learn is that we learn, even though we're Israelis, and we all, you know, uh, um, live there. You really need to learn your country in depth, because when you go abroad, you have to bring this knowledge with you, right? So, um, so you, in my time, it was usually six months of intensive course, and then you did two nine months, um, kind of like internship in different departments of the ministry. And after two years, you're sent on your first posting. Um, nowadays, it's different because of all kinds of re reasons. We don't necessarily have a diplomatic course every year. So sometimes people are, and I really feel bad for the younger generation because they do this, this six months course and then the next day they're on the plane and they're, they stand out to represent the, you know, the countries and, and diplomatic missions around the world without having you know, um, deep knowledge of how the, the, the system works. So I was fortunate enough, of course, to be a, a, a um, at the time when we still had to, you know, spend time in the ministry. And I was fortunate enough to spend three years in Israel before to going on my first posting. But during these three years, I did two terms of uh, um, sh like short-term missions. The first one was in the embassy of Israel in Luanda, Angola in Africa. I think this was probably one of the, my most um, um, adventurous postings. I always say that this, this was the, the longest two months of my life um because it was at the time even now it's not like an easy place to you know to be as a diplomat uh, um and just you know in general but at the time there were literally maybe a year or two after the uh, civil war there ended 
um, with still a lot of problems between the rebels and the government, um, with government that is controlling a lot of, um, of the oil drills in the sea, with the rebels that have a lot of, you know, diamond mining back in the jungle. So they all had, they had funds to fund, you know, 25 year old civil war. So you come at the point where the war has ended, but there's still a lot of things going on between this, you know, two, you know, enemies of yesterdays and not really friends. So it was a very interesting um, uh, time to be in Angola. Um, I was also fortunate enough to be there with um, Ambassador Dr. Tamar Golan, the late Tamar Golan, who was one of the, um, the really such an expert in Africa. She spent most of her adult, adult life in Africa and, and she was such an amazing uh, uh, mentor to me in everything in life and in diplomacy. Um, but imagine a place where you can't really walk in the street because it was completely unsafe. The, you know, the minutes, you know, when you have, a, when you know, you're not a local, immediately they know that you have money. It's as simple as that. They don't care whether you're a diplomat, they don't care about diplomatic immunity, they don't care about any of this stuff. So I literally, in this two months that I spent there, I walked in the street once with like six uh, policemen around me. That was the only time I walked everywhere. You, you go with a car. Um, you know, food, we literally lived on boxes coming in the diplomatic mail from Israel. Like that's what we ate for two months because there was nothing. You walk into a supermarket, empty shelves. You still hear shooting in the streets. And that was the time, you know, with the, um, when Princess Diana was going with her big campaign about landmines, because these are the places where, you know, the land was covered in mines. You walk in the street, you see kids, you know, you know, with crutches because they, they lost a, a, lot, a leg or foot. Really, really, you know, things that we can't really imagine when we live in, in you know, in Canada or in, in, in Israel or in, in the US. So that was really, I think a, a bit of a, um, a growing up <laughs> period for me when you realize that the world and th this bubble that you grow up in is not really, you know, reality. And there's so many other realities around the world. Mm -hmm. So that was my first short term posting. My second one was in Costa Rica. So there you go. You have like Angola on one side of the spectrum and you have Costa Rica on the other side of the spectrum. And that was like heaven. Um, so my um, almost five months in Angola were, you know, another experience, another experience and another interesting period of, in life because there I found myself um, with a very broken Spanish at the time, um, having to um, renovate um, and practically build a new embassy. <laughs> um, without a lot of experience in doing this kind of stuff. But this is something that, you know, Israeli embassies are very tiny. You know, usually you have an ambassador, you have a, a deputy chief of mission that is sometimes also the administrator, administrator and consul, and you have a chief of security and you have like some Israelis, you know, the spouses working and local workers, that's it. I'm always amazed when I come across the American <laughs> embassies, like they have such a huge operation here and we're always tiny, but we, you know, we, we make do with what we have. So you find yourself in Costa Rica having to do such a huge a project and, and, and every day you wake up and you say, how the hell am I going to do it? And at the end of the day, you do it. So again, I think that every, every step of the way was um, such an enormous, learning experience for me. Um, so let me ask, what was, what was your, your, aside from the current posting, what was your favorite posting in the last 20 years or so? It's, it's, it's an interesting question. Let's put aside the, the, the short-term missions in Angola and Costa Rica, but my long-term missions were, my first full-time diplomatic mission was as the deputy chief of mission in uh, Lima, Peru. So, by then, I think I really worked on my Spanish, <laughs> so that was uh, language-wise was a bit easier. And then uh, I moved to Toronto, where we met, um, where I was a deputy consul general in Toronto and Western Canada. 
I think it's the second largest area for a diploma Israeli diplomatic mission after Moscow, because it's all the way to British Columbia. It's huge. Um, so that was our second posting. Then I went uh, back to Israel and I was there for a few years before going to Berlin as a um, uh, political uh, counselor advisor for um, internal politics, which was very, very interesting. And then again, I went back to Israel for years and then coming here. So I would say it's a difficult question because every, every place you've been is kind of like, you know, being, becoming part of you. But I would say the most natural fun place for me was probably Toronto. And that's not <laughs> the, also because of the people I met, but I think it was just, you know, cultural wise, language wise, was kind of like a, an easy fit because you come to a city with such a large and strong, vibrant Jewish community, which really welcomes you with open arms. Um, it's so different from, you know, where I am now, or from Peru, where the Jewish community is so small and fragile and, and weak. And when you come to a place like Toronto, it's like you're almost home, you know? You have everything you need. Um, and, uh, and I think most of the work was in and around, you know, the local Jewish community life. Um, I remember not even meeting a lot of, you know, diplomats at the different consulates there because it was not needed, you know? I was so well connected in the Jewish community. When you're so well connected in the Jewish community, you don't need anything work-wise. Mm -hmm. And also it's, you know, it's Canada, come on, you know, it's such a beautiful place, <laughs> traveling. You know, I've been to places that I think, you know, regular Canadians have never been. I've been to um, Yukon, I've been to Nunavut, I've been to, you know, <clears throat> like everywhere pretty much, like all corners of Canada. So that was wonderful. And the friendships I made there, you know, are, are still there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you touched on something very interesting there that you were back and forth. You had postings in Israel, in the ministry, and then you went back abroad. And I wanted to ask if you could, in a, you know, briefly tell us about the difference, particularly as you got more senior, uh, between being posted abroad and being posted in, uh, in the ministry. Because, you know, as, as your last few positions, if I recall, in, in Israel, were progressively more senior and with more responsibility. And then you, you go and, and you take an ambassadorship. So what's the distinction, really the difference for a, a, an Israeli diplomat um, in terms of the, the work, the responsibilities? Um, that's, that's a very interesting, you know, angle to look at it because when, you, when you're in it, you don't always, you know, realize, but it's an, it's an interesting, thank you for letting me take a step back and kind of like, you know, really, uh, examine it uh, properly. Um, well, it's it's a it is it's very different. It's very different, especially compared to the the, the actual job that you do. Because um, in Israel, you're pretty much at headquarters. You are headquarters to the entire Israeli diplomatic corps around the world. So you're pretty much like um you're giving services to the embassies around the world. You're there for them. If they need information, budget, direction, uh, policies, everything is directed from headquarters. But the, I, I, maybe I'll be exaggerating, but I, when I'll say that the real diplomatic work is done abroad, because you know, you're know you out there, you're on the ground, right. you're making connections, you, uh, we will, I will talk about that exactly, you know, but the, you know, the real type of work that we do abroad. But when you're at headquarters, you, you're there to, to, uh, uh, to assist the embassies and consulates around the world. Um, most of the work that I've done at headquarters, most of my time there, I spend at, diplom at, uh, at uh, uh, public diplomacy. This is my has always been my uh, my uh, my area of um, of interest and, and expertise, and I did quite quite uh, um, a few um, uh, um, things there. I was um, deputy spokesperson of the ministry, uh, dealing with the foreign press. Um, I was dealing with Hasbara, you know, with public diplomacy with um, uh, with the Europe, and I did my last posting actually was something that I 
pretty much created out of um, you know thin air because when I came back from Berlin, um, I uh, and this is something very interesting because I don't think it happens in a lot of other foreign ministries, but in Israel, when you as, as a diplomat, you come with a certain idea or direction that you want to take and it, it doesn't exist and you come to the right people, they will say, you know, go with it, fly with it. So I, I created a, an entire section department dealing with uh, uh, the way uh, diplomacy, uh, Israeli diplomacy is, is uh, um, dealt with with the Israeli public. Because my way of thinking was, is that Israelis, you know, our people, they don't know what Israeli diplomats do. And, you know, I'm sure that most of you are very knowledgeable, but, you know, the average Israeli, if you'd ask him what a diplomat do, they would say, diplomats do, they would say, you know, you go to cocktail parties and um, you live in fancy houses and you um, spend the, the taxpayers' money. This is what the average Israeli would say, This seriously. And, uh, and it's really, really important for us. It was important for me. And when I brought it in to the ministry, they said, yeah, you have a point. So um, um, I was giving the, um, you know, the freedom to create this department that will do a lot of uh, uh, outreach to the Israeli public and will create, you know, events and seminars and visits to the ministry. So we'd be able to present uh, Israelis with what is diplomacy, what is Israel diplomacy, and it was and really, really, really interesting. And I worked a lot with uh, with youth, with um, with high schoolers. Um, there's a very interesting um, program now in many high schools in Israel, which is actually diplomacy and international communication in English. Uh, I don't know if many of you know, but you know in Israel, like this whole SAT thing called Bagrut. The most Israelis do what we call five points of English in the Bagrut. These kids do 10. They do five, you know, grammar, all this language, and five in diplomacy and international communications. And I pretty much adopted this program and we did amazing, amazing things with them. And I'm actually going to join in next month for their online uh, uh, summit and participate from from um, Tashkent. So, um, so basically there's the, 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 this is, I think the, the major difference is when, when you talk about diplomacy, I'm exaggerating because there's a lot of diplomacy happening in Israel, right? You know, when the, when the, um, the, the foreign minister of Hungary was just in Israel recently, it's diplomacy naturally, you know, you come together, you, 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 you sit, you negotiate, you, you sign the agreement. There's a lot of things that are happening in Israel. And, and also I always say that if people want to get to know Israel, the best thing to do, not in COVID times, of course, is to actually hop on a plane and go there. So we hosted a lot of delegations and, and it's a fun thing to do. But the everyday, you know, small details of diplomacy are done abroad. I hope that answered your question. It did, way. actually. Thank you very much. It's very comprehensive. I had one more question on this angle of, of the, you know, the work in the foreign ministry. Uh, this past week, uh, we all uh, recognized um, International Women's Day, and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, not not just as a as a as a woman in the foreign ministry, but as a mom, um, what what kind of advantages or challenges do women encounter in the Israeli Foreign Service? Okay, wow, that's a that's a big one. Um... I think that maybe the first, I wouldn't even call, yeah, there are challenges naturally. Even, you know, even the, the foreign ministry today, um, I would give them a lot of credit that things have changed in the last, you know, 25 years that I've been there. Um, when I joined in, it wasn't really a question of, uh, um, it wasn't like, you know, 20 years before when it was like evidently, you know, male dominated, you know, ministry. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, at photos, sorry, of, of the diplomatic courses, you see like, you know, 15 people, two women, you know, it gradually changed even to the mid 90s when I joined in. I was, by the way, uh, um, part of the largest diplomatic course in the, uh, in the history of the foreign ministry. We were right, 95, right after the uh, Oslo Accords. We were naive enough that, you know, to think that we're going to be in Damascus and in Riyadh the next year. 
um, a lot of change since. Uh, but also, you know, we have three new diplomatic uh, missions just, you know, recently in, in, in Bahrain and Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Morocco. So, so let's put this aside for a second. We'll go back to the uh, two women. And um, um, in, in my course, I think there were still more men than women. But um, I don't remember it being like a huge issue. I, I must admit, though, I joined in as a very, I was very young, I was 24. Um, I definitely remember walking into um, conference, you know, rooms where, you know, the vast majority were men, you know, older men. And, uh, and it wasn't necessarily um, an easy experience all the time. But uh, um, as, you know, as I grew and as, you know, the years, moved on, um, I've realized that even though there are challenges, and especially, you know, for, for mothers, et cetera, and I will talk about it in a second, but I, when I look at it now, I actually see it as, a, um, as an advantage, and I, I would love to elaborate. Um, first of all, um, as a mother, my own situation in life is, 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 is kind of unique because I'm, I'm a single mom, um, and, um, uh, so this has also advantages and disadvantages. My first posting with my son, who's now 10, was in Berlin. And uh, we, um, I took him there when he was a baby. He was like seven months old. And um, imagine a situation in which you're a diplomat and you have a baby at home. Um, you really, and you don't have a spouse, so you really need to have somebody else with you, right? So I needed to have a nanny living with us. And this is not something the foreign ministry is paying for, right? And I was in Berlin, you know, this is not Uzbekistan. Things are much more expensive. So immediately, you know, a big chunk of my salary went on uh, uh, just to give myself the chance to be a diplomat with a baby. So it's kind of absurd, but that was the situation. Um, it, of course, now he's older, so it's easier. So this is a very unique experience for me. But I have friends who, um, who went through the same experience even with spouses. It's not always easy. Let's talk about the spouse issue. Um, what do they do? You know, how about their, what about their career? This is something that is extreme, something that you really have to take into account before you go into this profession. I know that we live in the 21st century and a lot of people, you know, are doing, you know, relocation here and there and people realize that they don't have to live in, you know, in their hometown for their entire lives. And you can actually, you know, go see the world and do this and do that. But uh, um, um, in this type of, of work, um, you practically one of the, the spouses has to give up on his own career. So that's really not easy. So in a way, I look at my situation as an advantage because I have, I can make all the decision myself. And um, for me, it's kind of easy, but um, but it's not necessarily the case. Then again, um, in, in in Toronto nowadays, our amazing consul general there, Gali Baram, uh, she's married to a diplomat. So there's a diplomatic couple and she's the consul general and he's her deputy and they managed to work together wonderfully. So um, it's, it's, it is complicated, but if, if let's, let's get to, to, to nowadays. So when, when you come to a place like Uzbekistan um, as a woman ambassador uh, in a country that is still very much um, male dominated, um, still very traditional in many aspects, even though there are some changes that maybe we'll have time to talk about soon. Um, and it's, um, it's an interesting experience. It's an interesting experience. And I, if as a young diplomat, I walked into a room in Israel full of, you know, older, the older generation male diplomats, now I can walk into a room and I'm the only woman. Is it, what, what do you do in this type of situation? Do you kind of like cave in and hide in the corner or are you just, walk in and you know and use it and take advantage of it i usually try to do that i i'm saying i'm the only one you will notice me 
I want to thank you so much. I want to shift gears and quickly um, talk about Uzbekistan. Uh, uh, and then we're going to get to some questions. Uh, so you were appointed ambassador in July of this past year of 2020. Um, you know, so I guess, first of all, what were your first impressions of Uzbekistan? I guess just beyond what you've shared with us. And, and since then, what, you know, what have you learned? Okay, so th what, what happened this year was very, very unique. I don't know to, you know, how far you follow the, the situation in Israel, I'm pretty sure you do, but for a very long time, things have been, and as you know, when we have elections, you know, up in the air, yeah. up in the <laughs> air. We, we actually uh, um, voted on Thursday at the, at around, around the world at the different embassies and consulates. Um, mm -hmm. So for a very long time, the foreign ministry was in a bit of a, of a standstill. Um, we didn't have um, um, an acting, a full acting minister and things are really, really slow. And it had a very, I think, strong, even psychological effect on, 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 on Israeli diplomats. It, it doesn't mean that we didn't do our job and we didn't do it well, but it was like out there. Same thing with, with um, you know, nomination. So for a long time, nothing happened. I was actually aiming uh, to becoming Consul General in Miami. That was my, my, that was my direction for a very long time. It was a, I presented my nomination and nothing happened for about a year, almost a year. And, and then they started, uh, um, they, they, they set up a, a, um, a time to um, nominate finally ambassadors. I'm talking about almost, you know, June, 2020 when people were supposed to leave that summer. It's a crazy notion, you know? And Miami wasn't on the list. And I realized, listen, I told myself, if, if you wanna go on a diplomatic mission this summer, you really have to change course. So I looked at the list and decided to change course completely. And, um, and um, I chose Uzbekistan because and believe me, at the time, I didn't know pretty much, I knew nothing about the place. I mean, I knew of the Silk Road and I knew of, you know, this, the, the magnificent cities of Bukhara, Bukhara and Samarkand. And, and you know, there's a, a, a large Bukhari and Jewish community in Israel, naturally, also in New York, but not much, really not much. And, but I, I remember from, you know, from um, former friends who served there, they all said that it was really interesting and it wasn't too far from Israel. You know, it's like four hours away, four and a half hours away. So I said, you know, I'll give it a shot, really. I've never done anything like this in my life. Like the whole decision was very, you know, out there. And then fortunately enough, I, 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 uh, I got the job. Um, I wasn't the only candidate. I was, um, um, I think I had about seven or eight other people um, out there with me, but I was fortunate enough to get it. And then imagine within two months, I was already here. So this is really unlikely in any foreign service. Mm -hmm. When I talk to American investor, American uh, diplomats, they always tell me, oh yes, before going to Uzbekistan, I'm, I spent eight months in the uh, language school in Washington, you know, studying Russian. I'm like, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> It really wasn't the situation here. I'm, I'm studying Russian, buddy. Yeah. So you, so within two months, you really have to relocate yourself, not only physically but mentally, mm -hmm. and move to move to a new place that you know nothing about. So and in COVID times, right, uh, which complicates <laughs> which is, everything. I, complicates I think it, everything. I think it might be a, a a good opportunity if we could go to some of your pictures. Um, anything that you want to share with us, uh, Dave? Can we? Uh, or Yardena, can we pull that up? Yes, one second. Okay. So this this is actually the clip. And if we can see if we can see the clip, it'll be nice. Can we if you go back? Yes. So this is a clip that we produced here after coming here. And this is nice because it kind of like uh, talks about my aspirations as, as uh, in my time here as, a, as an, an ambassador in, uh, in Uzbekistan. And I hope we so, get it to work. <laughs> there we go. Is it playing? No. 
No. No, I'm not. Don't think so. Okay. okay. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It okay. doesn't matter. So no, no, this is just uh, this we can probably um, um, just uh, uh, a reminder of you know all the wonderful place that you, places that you um, you get to go as an Israeli diplomat. You know, you know China and Japan and Washington. This is it's it's um. It's that's a always, photo. It, I'm sorry, Zavit. That's a photo. Not a lot of people are going to be able to take anymore in front of the Capitol. <laughs> There's a wall. <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's yeah. That's that's a good. I don't know. 15 years ago, I think. Um, and I haven't been to Washington in a very long time. But um, uh, at the time when I was in public diplomacy, we used to go probably once a year to Washington, um, New York. Um, sometimes Atlanta because of CNN for two weeks of like an in-depth seminar uh, on public diplomacy, on spokesmanship, or press, um, uh, uh, government. It was an amazing, amazing experience. And I, 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 I was a privilege to do it like I think four times. So, um, uh, so that was always, always nice. Um, to Japan and China. Japan I was actually uh, heading the, 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 the um, political desk in the foreign ministry. Yeah, I think it was the only, almost the only posting I ever had in the foreign ministry that wasn't public diplomacy. Um, and and uh, uh, as a result, I, I managed to go to Japan a few times and uh, really get to know them, them, this amazing culture. To China, I went as part of a delegation of, um, of Israeli diplomats, and it was cr really a crazy experience. I mean, the Chinese, they really know how to host. And, um, and it, it was kind of like a, a, a touristic slash diplomatic mission, and it was, it was wonderful. So, you know, yes, diplomacy takes us to, to really, really amazing places. Want to move to the next slide? <laughs> I have a visitor. Come say hi. He just woke up. <laughs> Go back to bed. Laila told mommy. So this is just a, a, a quick reminder of, of um, the work that I've been doing before coming here. Uh, and it, uh, it's like nurturing the, the next generation of Israeli diplomats, you know, working with Israeli youth, um, doing a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, public speaking and seminars in the ministry. And, um, and really allowing them to understand the nature of this wonderful, wonderful profession. Um, and um, I, as I said before, this is something I'm really, really proud of because I've created this whole operation uh, myself and I've left a wonderful, I'm really, really thankful legacy in the ministry and it goes on and it continues and it grows and flourishes. And I'm really, really happy about this. So, thank you, Zavid. Are there, is there any one specific picture you wanna, you wanna highlight for us? Um, because um, I, I'd like I to think, go to questions. Think, sure, sure. I think the next ones are, we can, we can uh, um, this is really recent. This is from last week. Um, so this, um, we'll do it very, very briefly, but uh, public, I, I put this in the, the one before just to highlight, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the things that we do as diplomats, whether it's, you know, uh, speaking to the press or doing public speaking events. This was really a wonderful uh, uh, experience talking to um, young uh, Uzbek uh, teenagers who are studying IT. And it was the, this was a summit after a hackathon that they were doing. Um, and it was just lovely because I was the only ambassador. And this will probably uh, uh, um, a good demonstration of the way Israel is being conceived here in the, the whole concept of Israel here in, in Uzbekistan is of a very advanced, modern, innovative country. So when they actually do an event like this and they want to invite an ambassador, they will invite the Israeli ambassador. And the fact that I was a woman is a bonus because this was an all girls event. So that was nice. We can just run through. And if I have, like I said, one word or two, um, this is a visit I had, I did in, in a school here. And one of the kids surprised me with this uh, uh, very lovely gift. We gave um, um, the Ministry of Education here um, protection, protective gear for COVID for 12,000 uh, students. 
uh, in Peru. So the, in Peru, in Uzbekistan. So this is the uh, this is one of the photos we can just run through. And if there's one important thing, I will say it again. We're working a lot of with the uh, humanitarian aid. This is uh, something we did for the um, uh, we did for the Tajiks. This is an awareness campaign we did before uh, for Breast Cancer Month, which is something that is not common here in Uzbekistan. A lot of women, unfortunately, are dying from breast cancer because they go, don't go to the doctor soon enough. So it was important to us as a very, you know, modern country to just, you know, shed a light on this and say, you know, go check yourself. This is the, um, the Bukharian um, synagogue here in Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan during Hanukkah, where I went to light some candles. The next one I think is from Bukhara. Yes, this is me and the kids in the Jewish school in Bukhara, which is the, the funniest thing ever because this school is operating for a long, long time and very small amount of the kids there are actually Jewish because there are not a lot of Jews in the school, but even locals are sending their kids <coughs> to the school. They study Hebrew, they sang songs. It was so funny and they're not even Jewish, but they, they really appreciate the culture. So they do that. Um, next one is me with the ambassador, the Emirati ambassador, the UAE ambassador. Um, it's kind of nice to be an ambassador in, you know, in the time of Abraham Accords and to be able to reach out and, and, and do things with our newfound friends. And I hope to do a lot of interesting projects um, uh, with the uh, UAE ambassador. And this is me presenting my credentials to uh, President Milzi Yoyev. Uh, the president of Uzbekistan. I hope that I'll be able to talk a little bit about the, you know, continue on talking about the work that we do here. And I think the last one, the last photo. Uh, oh, this is Elam that you saw. <laughs> this is my son right after I presented my credentials. So um, I, I, I asked him, I said, come, come, come. You know, the limousine is still out there and you see the, uh, the motorcade that was accompanying me to the to the, to the the palace come come and let's let's uh, take a photo a reminder of this day and i think the last photo of me is in me yes this is me in uh, in samarkand in Dagestan. this is um uh, uh, a long uh, dream of mine to get to this place and i i would never in a million years think that i would go there as the ambassador of israel i would probably think that i would go there as a tourist but um, I, I managed to go there and it was as amazing as it looks in the photo. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to open it up now. If anybody's got a question for Zahavit, uh, perhaps you could put it in the chat. If we don't see any, I have a question or two, another additional one, but I really encourage everybody to uh, uh, see if you have anything you wanted to ask. Okay, so I, I, have, uh, I have a question. I have a question. It's here, Dana. Um, I just wanted to know, just with all the changes that have happened since the Abraham Accords, is this excitement shared by, you know, other people? Well, I guess like other embassies or consulates all over? Um, and do you think that there will be sort of newer announcements coming along in the next year or two, uh, you know, about other uh, um, possibilities of other diplomatic relationship with countries that, that Israel has not had with previously. Um, thank you, uh, Dana. Yes, well, the excitement is definitely shared by other um, um, embassies, even here in Uzbekistan. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about other embassies. Uh, the um, the um, UAE, Uzbekistan, and Israel actually. Uh, joined together on um, on a fund. They actually the Uzbeks are have joined the Abraham Fund uh, um, that was established by the U.S. and Israel because they understand that they want to become part of this you know really amazing thing. Um, you have to understand that here in Uzbekistan the the Emiratis are very very active. They're investing a lot of money. They have a lot of uh, you know economic ventures here. So the, the Uzbeks understand that if they want to have the, a share of this, you know, uh, uh, um, amazing project, they, you know, they may as well be join in. And this is something that we've never even imagined, you know, five or five or even 10 or five years ago, that the Uzbeks would be, want to be part of it. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, 
And I think all my colleagues around the world are really uh, uh, taking advantage of this uh, um, uh, new friendships. Um, here we only have uh, um, a UAE embassy. We don't have uh, the Bahrainis are not here or the Moroccans are not here. So, um, so I can tell you, you know, what it's like to be, to, you know, to um, join forces with um, with other um, uh, embassies. But really, I can tell you, I give you a good example of of, of this wonderful friendship. On my first meeting with the um, Emirati ambassadors, I was complaining that I can't find Tchina, Tachini here, and I can't find Silan. You know, Silan is the, the kind of like the honey you made from dates. Honey. Yeah. And um, complaining, complain, because, you know, I, I like Tchina and I like Silan. And I brought from Israel, of course, naturally, but, you know, it will be over soon. And it's not like you can hop on a plane and go to Israel and buy more, right? Come New Year's, I get a box as a, you know, a New Year's gift from the Emirati ambassador with like kilos of Tchina and Silan <laughs> that he had the ability to bring from, from, uh, from the UAE because the flights to Dubai are, you know, open. And really, literally, I don't think I have to buy anything for the next two years. Mm -hmm. So this was such a lovely thing because he listened. <laughs> you remember this was at least two, three months after. So that was wonderful. Um, and I think all my friends, my colleagues around the world are really, really enjoying this. Um, and then we come together with our this um, uh, new friends and we do things together. For example, my I'm planning on, um, on uh, World Earth Day on um, April 22nd, I, I want to invite the Emirati ambassador to plant trees with me. You know, we need a lot of trees in the world, so why not do it together and, and you know, it's an act of friendship and peace and also, you know, something good for the environment. Um, so everything, everything is, is, is doable. And it's nice to have opportunities that we didn't have before. Um, as for other countries, you know, I'm, I'm not that deep in the loop to, to, to tell you exactly what's happening, but, but, but I have a feeling that it's not gonna end here. I have a feeling that we're gonna have, you know, more, um, more countries joining this, the, the Abraham Accords and, uh, bringing more um, stability and, and, uh, and friendship and, and, and cooperation to, to the Middle East. I think that this is the only way to go. I think now that there's a true realization within these countries that it's doable. Uh, we don't have to you know, bring the Palestinians into the, uh, into the, the it's, not, it's not a valid argument anymore. Not, I'm not saying that we don't want to, uh, uh, um, find some kind of a lasting solution in our little part of the world. But it, it, I think this whole, what, hap what happened in the, in the last year or so just shows us this. Uh, um, we can do so much more uh, even, even in the current situation. So hopefully. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question here from David Stadmauer. Uh, it, it's a part of a larger, I guess, a question. Uh, he asked, what Israeli interests are you promoting in Uzbekistan? And I, I guess the, the, the other side of that coin is, what do the Uzbeks want from Israel? Um, so obviously, countries have interests, and those interests range in various different directions, whether they're economic or social or political or defense-oriented, etc. Uh, so what are Israeli interests um, in, in Uzbekistan, and what's, what's the opposite, the corollary? I think that's um, fortunately enough, I would say that the, the, the interests are kind of like um, uh, um, joint because uh, as I said before, when you say Israel to, um, to the Uzbeks, whether it's the, you know, some person in the street and whether it's like, you know, ministers in the government, they would say innovation, they would say, you know, high tech, they will say um, agricultural technologies. And these are the things that we want to bring to Uzbekistan anyways. So that's kind of wonderful. I would actually uh, um, make a point in saying that, you know, I've been to um, quite a few um, embassies and consulates in the past, but the openness um, and the accessibility that I find here are really unprecedented. I've been here, what, less than six months? I, I, I can't even, count how many ministers I've, I've met. And it's not necessarily, you know, I asked for the meeting, you know, I really, I, I, I'm being requested by the 
just to give you an example, last week I went with my um, deputy uh, to the agency, and this is, for example, another joint interest of, of both countries, to the agency um, in charge of um, uh, Uzbek's um, foreign workers going to work in, in other countries. They have a lot of Uzbeks working in Russia and Kazakhstan, and, um, and we're interested in, in promoting um, Uzbeks going to Israel to work as caregivers. Uh, because they, you know, they speak Russian, and it's it's um, it's something that you know goes hand in hand. So we go into the mini meeting, um, you know, planning of meeting the the head of the agency, but the person sitting in front of me is actually the Minister of Labor and Employment of Uzbekistan, and I didn't even know. You know, he decided he heard that I'm coming, so he decided that he wants to meet and meet in and go come into and and have this discussion with me. So this is something, it really they they. They're really open. They really want to to uh, um, to uh, um, do whatever they can in, in promote this this um, mutual interest. So it can go from uh, uh, um, signing an agreement on on employment, which is a huge interest for both countries because they want to send their people to Israel because they know they'll be treated right. They will be paid, you know, uh, nicely, and 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 uh, and they can always, you know, come back home. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, agriculture, this is still a very much an agricultural country. So, uh, uh, and, and, there's, and there's a huge difference between, you can see new joint ventures and farms that are really, really modern with wonderful technologies. And when you go further and further inland, you, you see people that are working the land the same way they did hundreds of years ago. Um, and this is a huge interest of the president to really take the, the agriculture of this country to the 21st century. And this is a wonderful thing for us because Israel is an expert on these issues with, uh, with irrigation technologies, with the um, smart uh, uh, agriculture. So uh, kind of like really, really, it's a one, uh, as I'm saying, it's a wonderful time to be an Israeli ambassador in Uzbekistan in that respect, because this really is uh, um, uh, um, the time to be, there's a lot of openness, there's a lot of willingness on both sides, and I'm happy to be the person here to, you know, bring this together. Great, thank you. Uh, we have we have two more questions. Uh, and the first of them is from Esther Saban, and she asks, are the Jews in Uzbekistan interested in making Aliyah, and how large is the Jewish community there? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and I, I'm not even sure that I can, I can answer it uh, um, fully because you know it always goes to the um to the question of you know who's a jew uh, out of the people that are still left here so at, at at its height the jewish community here uh was very large i think something around 200 300 thousand uh, jews um it's a very interesting community community because it was um for many for centuries you know, the Bukharian Jews, we call them Bukharian Jews, but they're not necessarily from Bukhara. You know, they were <laughs> in other cities uh, in Samarkand, in Tashkent, but for some reason they called the Bukharian Jews. By the way, their language that they speak, Bukharian language is kind of like a dialect of, uh, of, uh, of Persian, which is not similar to Uzbek language at all. The Uzbek language is from the Turkish family and their family is like, their language is more like Tajik, which is a Persian family. So, um, so they lived here for, for centuries, you know, very successful um, traders, you know, Jewish uh, people usually um, uh, manage to, to thrive wherever they are. And, um, and then an interesting thing happened during, uh, during the Second World War, uh, when um, a lot of uh, um, um, Jews were fleeing from naturally from Eastern Europe into uh, Russia and a lot of uh, 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 refugees and the Russians, you know, sent them everywhere and some of them, quite a few, came to Uzbekistan. And this is a very interesting chapter in, in, in the history of, of Uzbekistan that they're very proud of, uh, as they should, because many Uzbeks really opened their hearts and houses uh, to the Jewish refugees and they let them in. And, uh, and this is actually the beginning of what is called the Ashkenazi community in, uh, in Uzbekistan, mostly in Tashkent, but not just. And actually the vast majority of the Jewish community today are you know, these um, Ashkenazi Jews, because 
vast of the vast majority of the Bukharian Jews have actually emigrated immigrated already, either to Israel or to the U.S. There's also a community in Austria, but the, the big communities are either in Israel or in in the U.S. So what we have here now, number wise, that depends. You know, I hear five thousand and I hear thirty thousand. I really don't know what the right number is. But as far as Aliyah is concerned, yes, when people still want to make Aliyah, even now in COVID times, um, we are supposed to um, uh, uh, send out um, actually a, a, a plane full of Olim, uh, but um, 150, 160 Olim are supposed to go to Israel in the next few weeks. So yes, this, this is still, it's still happening. Thank you. Uh, before I get to the last question, I just wanted to point out um, that my father was one of those refugees uh, in Xilorda in Kazakhstan, just a few hundred miles from where you're sitting now. Um, and the family eventually went back to Poland. But uh, so I, I completely understand that, that uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people came um, and found a, a safe place, um, not an easy place, but a safe place to be at that yeah. time. Um, so the last question is from Harriet Mandel. And she wanted you to expand on the uh, wonderful Mashav program that has been and remains so critical in making friends for Israel all across the world. Wonderful, thank you, Harriet. Uh, uh, Mashav is definitely uh, um, an important um, part of uh, Israel's foreign policy. Uh, naturally, most mostly in, in developing country, but not but not not only. Um, it is the uh, foreign aid arm of Israel, and it's part of the foreign ministry, as opposed to, um, you know, other governments like the Canadians or the Americans have their, you know, own independent agencies. But in Israel, it's part of the of the foreign ministry. Um, Mashav was established in the uh, in the late 50s by Golda Meir, who was um, uh, then foreign minister. I'm still, by the way, asked whether I'm named after her. You know, Zehavit Golda. By the way, my name is Zehavit Golda. Um, which is kind of funny because it's the same name. I don't know what you know went through my my parents' um, minds when they did that, but I'm actually named after my grandmother, not after Golda Meir. Even though it's nice, you know, diplomats um, share interest. Um, and so she was visiting Africa in the late 50s, and um, and she decided that uh, an agency should be established. And it was kind of nice because at the late 50s. Let me remind you, you know, Israel wasn't the advanced country that it is today, you know, it was basically a developing country with a lot of issues and problems. But even then, uh, uh, this uh, uh, notion of uh, tikkun olam on one hand, and the notion that we still, even though we don't have a lot, we can still give, which I think are very basic, you know, Jewish values. <coughs> Of Tzedaka, of Netina. And uh, so, um, so the agency was established even then. And it's based on a very um, simple um, notion that we are not uh, giving funds necessarily. We're not, you know, um, you know, take a million dollars, do something with it, like many of the UN agencies here are doing. Uh, um, we're giving knowledge. We are uh, uh, the basic uh, um, uh, method behind Mashav's activities is we call it the train the trainers. You know, we take people that are have some kind of knowledge, some kind of expertise, and we teach them much more about their own expertise so they can pass on this knowledge to others. So the areas that we deal with are education, naturally, uh, public health, <laughs> agriculture, of course, and all kinds of issue government that we can actually give uh, uh, Israeli know-how and pass it on so these people can take it and, and make something out of it. And it's wonderful because we have countries, um, for example, in Kenya, uh, the entire uh, uh, education for elementary education and, and, and kindergarten education is based on an Israeli model because up until then, you know, Kenyan kids went to kindergarten, they played, they didn't do anything. And now they learn the alphabet. They learn all kinds of things that, you know, are very uh, normal for us because, you know, our kids do that in, in kindergarten, but they didn't do it back then. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of like helping them. 
uh, uh, to advance in that respect. So naturally here in Uzbekistan, we're dealing with uh, um, um, agriculture. We do agricultural uh, uh, courses. Uh, here we bring experts here, we send Uzbeks to Israel to do uh, 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 courses. Now we do it online. Uh, thankfully enough, the foreign ministry uh, is going to send a full-time uh, um, expert, agricultural expert to be part of our embassy. So you can, you know, do courses, you know, all year wrong. That's a wonderful, wonderful benefit. We don't have that uh, a lot nowadays. I think we have one in India, one in China, but not in, not in Central Asia. So I see it as a wonderful benefit. Uh, public health, naturally. Um, so it's, um, for, for many of us, so some of my fellow diplomats, this is the main work that they do in Africa, for example. Most of the work that they do is in and around Mashav. Um, so um, a wonderful tool. And I'm very happy that uh, the ministry is, um, is investing in that. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I can tell you, I, you know, I, follow, I follow Israeli diplomacy, as you know. Um, and uh, I thought I knew something about it, but I clearly <laughs> I learned, I learned a lot tonight. And I wanted to thank you for giving us so many insights and, and giving us your time. Uh, we all appreciate not just your time today, but everything that you're doing, uh, because when you do something on behalf of uh, the state of Israel, you're also by extension doing something on behalf of the Jewish people, and we're very grateful. So thank you so, so much, and uh, have a Chag Sameach uh, from all of us here, and uh, have a great day, uh, as yours is starting and ours is ending. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ari, for this opportunity. It was lovely meeting all of you. Pesach Sameach. We're going to have a seder, hopefully, here at the residence with a very tiny Israeli community here. Uh, um, so I wish you all Chag Sameach and uh, have a wonderful evening. Great. Thank you. Shavua Tov. Everybody, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to say hello. Don't forget to change your clocks. Um, and I'll just plug that March 17th, we're hearing from Dr. Shira Weiss for a little pre-Pesach share. Good night, everybody.